tent from the floor. If you have some questions or uh, comments that you'd like to share and ask our speakers. So uh, there are uh, four microphones there, the plenary area. I'd like to begin and just to start the ball rolling. Uh, I know that Father Pierre has been in the Philippines for a number of times since the 19, 1980s, early 80s. And uh, he has been visiting professor of the Ate de Manila through the years. And I, I, I'm sure that you have seen the change of uh, socio-political landscape in the country and how your Jesuit brothers in the Philippines have responded. We would be interested to uh, listen to your observations as to how uh, Jesuit institutions like Ateneo and Jesuits and our lay colleagues and partners have responded to what you precisely uh, presented in terms of um, making the Catholic Church social doctrine active in our country and uh, the, the is Ignatian inspiration for social justice be alive. Any observations that you'd like to tell us? <laughs> That's becoming a problem. Um, I came the first time in 1982, so that's uh, already 30 years. And uh, I was surprised by the great modernization of the country in many ways. It's, uh, many things have been developed and, it's, and it works and so on. At the same time, I was surprised I could find the same name in politics. Juan Ponce Enrile and others, they were already there 30 years ago. So in many ways, <laughs> it's the same people there. And the society has been uh, taking a lot of different initiatives. And we have seen all the lists of uh, institutions is very impressive. And it seems that it's more uh, the capacity to, to explain is better than years ago. And uh, it's more clear, it's more focused. Uh, the problems we had to deal with 30 years ago were more complicated in some, some sense. Uh, the question of violence was, was posed to many people. There were a lot of Christians who went into violence, and this, was, this is finished, but it's, it's, it had to be done, and it, it had to be very clear. So the work has been done, and the situation, I think, in that sense, is much better. But at the same time, it's, uh, there's a lot to do. And for me, one thing which is very important is uh, the building of a real state in charge of the common good. And what I'm, I'm happy to see that some people from the Ateneo are in government, and that they can do something, and we hope they do everything they can. So it's important that they be there. As uh, uh, Father Arupe said, uh, where, where are the Christians then? And that uh, it, could be pos it could not be possible to say what Colvin Bar said about uh, the alumni of uh, the uh, University of Beirut. They were there in front of Holy Jesuit, but they were the most corrupt of all. So that should be finished. And I think it's good to know that some uh, Ateneo people are in government doing a real good job because they have been here and they've been able to listen to what has been said around. Thank you, Father Pierre. Yes, I, uh, please introduce yourself. I am Maria Katrina Yadko of the class of 77 among the first co-eds. We were the intrepid ones. <laughs> anyway, um, I find that talk very lofty and you know, very inspiring, but allow me to share a personal experience and to um, seek counsel on how I should have reacted in a particular situation. This is something as mundane as getting a driver's license. I was at the LTO and um, I was aghast and upset when um, um, there is this uh, public servant, he would assess the uh, background of the applicant and when the applicant was a simple driver or, uh, yeah, a simple driver, 
I actually saw him open a drawer um, to facilitate the release of the test needed to process the driver's license. And my, um, uh, my problem then was how I should have um, reacted and also that led me to realize the the extent of corruption. I mean, it's a, I was hearing the drivers complain that, you know, pare 50 pesos din yun. And, and then I asked, why, why did you not um, complain? And he gives me a stare, na, duh. I mean, you know, that's, I, I wouldn't have gotten my license if, if I, these incidents like this are, are very disturbing and, um, you talk of justice, it's all very lofty and all, but I am talking about how to live that attitude, that promote that, that value in very mundane things that affect the little people, so to speak. Yeah. How should I have reacted in that particular situation? Yeah. Father Robert, can like to respond uh, to that? Maybe uh, two, uh, two, two parts to the, in answer to your sharing and uh, experience. Uh, thank you for sharing that. No? Uh, I'm sure it's a problem that many of us experience day to day. Uh, first of all, Father Arupe, I think, would, would say himself no, that if one is to take seriously the whole idea of justice, no, of living uh, righteously as a man or a woman for others, and which means upholding and following the law, no, then uh, setting the example, starting on a personal level, is probably uh, the best way to go. The difficult, but the best way to go. You know, to, not to follow, uh, no matter how uh, more convenient it makes it for you. you know, it, it, it becomes for you, you know, all these uh, invitations for corruption and the like. You know? But having said that, I, I fully appreciate how, uh, how difficult it is. You know? uh, uh, I must confess myself, no, at least once, no, when the MMDA caught me with a traffic violation, I had to say, Pari po ako. <laughs> and got away with it. No? So I'm not the best example for that. No? Uh, but secondly, this, uh, uh, I'm sure right now, even as we speak, Father Albert Alejo in the panel next door is probably speaking about the EHEM initiative of the Philippine province of the Society of Jesus, which uh, it started in the early... 2000, so 2001 or 2002, I believe, which was an attempt really to address this whole problem of corruption. And the whole point of the M program was to try to promote a culture of uh, what we now call whistleblowing, you know, of taking ordinary men and women caught up in these dilemmas as you have been, government servants and the like, and encourage them to speak out publicly. Uh, one of the uh, most well-known products of the HEM program is, of course, Heidi Mendoza, of uh, the Commission on Audit no, and, his, uh, and her famous uh, expose uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, but I think right now, no, uh, and given the thrust of the matuwid na daan of our president, I think, yes, it is still a problem, but there are also many possibilities by which we can become whistleblowers no, and possibly slowly, but uh, surely, hopefully, change society and free it of this terrible scourge of corruption. Thank you. Yes, please. Good morning, fathers. I'm Joyce Talag from um, Development Studies, Batch 2005. Well, um, lately, I noticed that um, there seems to be like a mass or a wave of uh, anti informal settlers or anti-poor sentiments in light of the recent um, demolitions uh, that have been going on around Metro Manila. And um, lately, I think it's been getting harder and harder to become, you know, uh, a Catholic, wherein you have to stand up for what you think is right. Like, let's say, I, I saw this, um, short, uh, I think it's a blog post on Facebook, and I reposted it. It contains like eight things that, you know, most people do not know about the so-called informal settlers. And then I would have like friends who would post 
anti-poor sentiments, and it really bothers me, except that uh, sometimes I feel like, you know, if I respond to them, I don't think Facebook is really the venue to create change. But it is extremely disturbing that there are a lot of social issues, let's say our age, divorce, all these things, that, um, you know, sometimes there are people, even uh, graduates of our school, uh, you know, it's every pe person's right to, like, take their own stand. Um, a lot of us would probably be moderate about certain issues. But uh, maybe in light of all these things, how do we promote, you know, all the three, uh, you know, the, the actions, uh, what do you call that, actions uh, for justice? How do we, um, you know, promote this to, like, um, students, the youth, or others who are not um, Athenians, um, using social media probably because this is the easiest way to get through them and these are, you know, uh, those who have access and probably would become our future leaders. I would appreciate your um, advice and maybe this is something that, you know, we can be engaged with. About Facebook, it's, which is an interesting uh, instrument. Uh, I'm not on Facebook and I will never be, for <laughs> sure not. Uh, the reason is that I think Facebook is useful as a mirror of opinion. And you say that you've seen there terrible things, which you don't agree with that. It's a mirror of opinion. It's a tool of communication, but nothing more. It has been, you just have to take it as a tool of communication. It's not an instrument of building a real community. You, you don't know those people. Or if you know them, it's because you know them somewhere else, out of Facebook. So the point is, uh, how do you organize a real society, civil society through associations, through local uh, NGOs, even through uh, political parties if you want to go to power, but at least uh, the animation of the civil society concretely through association is very, very important. And Facebook is no use. It's just useful for communication in order to do something else, which is the, the animation of the civil society through those institutions and associations or NGOs. But I think the, the animation of the civil society is very, very important. When you cre create movement of students, of movement of uh, people working in the same place or other things of that type, this is a creation, animation of civil society. And through that, you can really start defending ideas strongly. Even if you could see horrible things on Facebook. It's not, it's not the, the uh, all the good people are not on Facebook. Uh, they don't often spend their time uh, checking uh, with the Facebook. So it's often a certain type of people who would react very strongly, or even extreme people react extremely on Facebook. But the normal people, would uh, you will get them through the civil society, the animation, concrete animation of association of uh, local pe people to get together. Uh, like Father Pierre, I am also not on Facebook. Uh, last year when I went on tertianship, I shut down my account and I haven't opened it since. No? But, uh, but turning, if you go back to the document of Father Arupe, no? Men and Women for Others, Father Arupe, and this was early in the, seven, in the 70s, was actually speaking about the use of tools and technologies. But he was not referring here to the, of course, to the internet. What he was referring to was the, the whole instrument of social analysis. No? Uh, and I think uh, if we are to take the whole idea of social analysis seriously, which is really trying to understand what is happening around us, I appreciate your effort, for instance, to try to enlighten other people about their misconceptions about the urban poor. Then I think uh, something like Facebook no? uh, and other forms of social media can serve no? a very important purpose in furthering the reach of uh, social analysis. Because, uh, because I agree, no? even the, program, uh, the problem of informal settlers is a truly complex one. No? I was fortunate in my early years in the social apostle, uh, uh, in the early years of the, in the social apostolate, I was under the mentorship of Dr. Uh, Jane Caraos, Marlene Gatpatan, Father Tabora, and back then, no, uh, 
uh, there were all these issues about uh, passing a law for the urban poor, no? which eventually became the Urban Development and Housing Act. And it's surprising when you fast forward nearly 20 years later, we are still dealing with the same problems. The law is still not implemented. And I think the starting point for solving these complex problems is always understanding. It's always analysis. Otherwise, you go by very fleeting uh, misconceptions, which can be very deceptive or even harmful. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? My, I am convinced that action is needed, but uh, to what extent would an inspired person move, to, move himself to action? And I'm referring, there are two concrete examples I will cite, how people responded to action. Two brothers who are Jesuits in Nicaragua joined the Sandinistas. One, the older one, I think, was charismatic, and he was delivered the speeches in the plaza and so on. The other the younger one, I think, uh, was the guerrillero. He fought in the hills. They were Jesuits, and uh, Father Arupi was aware of this. The Jesuit order was aware of this, and they went on. The point is, they succeeded. The Sandinistas took over the government in Nicaragua, and uh, I think uh, the older brother, Fernando Cardinal, became a member of the cabinet, and Father Arupi was warned by the Pope that the, this guy, this Jesuit, has to make up his mind whether to be a member of the cabinet or the Jesuit order. And Father Rupi went to see Fernando Cardinal and asked him, you have two choices. Give up your cabinet uh, membership or resign from the Jesuit order. And the Father uh, Fernando Cardinal resigned from the Jesuit order. That's Nicaragua. And they are offering uh, asylum to that guy uh, hiding in Russia. Now, local situation. An Athenian, a classmate of mine, uh, the Asian Institute of Management, our valedictorian, very bright guy, graduated cum laude from the Ateneo, decided to act as well, a little on the extreme side. And he's now in jail. We visited him um, a few months back, and he said, Yuri, we need political reforms, social reforms, agrarian reform, and so many other environmental reforms, and so on and so forth. He's in jail. The highest he's gotten to where uh, he is affiliated uh, was a director of finance. Of course, he was a old class valedictorian. He knows finance, he knows uh, investments, and he knows financial analysis, he knows many things. No? Now, question is, how would you, to what extent, and to what limits, boundaries, would you push a guy to do action? And you have seen, People taking it literally, you see. Okay, thank you. So what would be the parameters of action in the Ignatian and Jesuit sense? Just to go back a second to the Nicaragua situation, that was in 1979, after the revolution, we threw away the dictators. They had the dictator for 40 years. And the only people remaining there able to enter the government where people of higher level of education. And so they asked four priests to be ministers of that government. I was there 10 years later in 1989. And uh, this was an interesting debate to see the change in 10 years. Now, it's clear that Fernando Cardenal had to leave the society because he couldn't do, he couldn't be at the same time priest and minister. So after several years, he. He gave up uh, his work of minister, and now he's back in the society. Mm. So it's, you see things change. But the context there is very important. Now for action today, I think it's clearly in a legal situation. I mean, you have to follow the law, but inside 
the legal situation, you have many possibilities. And for instance, those uh, of former Ateneo who entered the government, they can do a lot of things uh, in the legal uh, stretch of the law. So that's uh, the whole point. You should not ever go uh, Ill uh, in an illegal way or out of the possibility given by the country where you are. But in those uh, lines, many things are possible. So uh, answering a question from another angle, uh, and again, going back to St. Ignatius, I think when we look at uh, this very complex issue, you know, what is one called to do, it really brings us, I think, to the whole realm of uh, discernment, the reality that God calls uh, each of us, priests, lay people, in different ways. And when one d discerns one's response, one has to take in many factors, one's capabilities, the consequences for one's loved ones, one's capabilities and the like. You know? And I think, uh, I believe if one comes to a decision that has been thoroughly discerned and where one's conscience is at peace, then I think one should push through with that decision. You know? I, I mentioned earlier uh, someone like Heidi Mendoza. Uh, when, when she first came out for expose, uh, several among us in the John J. Carroll Institute on Church and so Social Issues was accompanying her through the process. Now his, her husband, uh, Roy Mendoza, who's a professor of history here at the Ateneo, was a very close friend of ours. And so we were uh, privy to the many uh, questions Heidi had to ask herself. If I come out with this expose, what will be the effect on my family? What will be the effect on our personal security? Uh, can we still live normal lives? And in a sense, they pay the price for that, she and her family. And yet she decided to act. Uh, and I think, in the end, was uh, redeemed no? uh, for, her, uh, for her actions. No? So, uh, the responses, the call varies, the responses will surely uh, vary, vary for us as well. I think the important thing to remember is that all of us are called uh, to discern and pray over the options no? within the parameters mentioned by Father Pierre. Thank you. Yes, uh, JD. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am... J.D. Zaldivar. I am not a Jesuit. Uh, I am a diocesan seminarian from San Jose Seminary. And I would just like to add to what to the information proffered by Father uh, Robert. Um, thank you first and foremost for the wonderful presentations, Father Spear and Father Robert. But I would like to ask, uh, I would like to add to what has been said that another area which the Jesuits are influencing for greater social apostolate is the area of um, um, forming priests, uh, diocesan priests, who are, um, who are more um, imbued with greater social concern. And for the information of many, I believe many are not aware here that the Jesuits in the Philippines are forming many diocesan priests who are doing very well in their dioceses. And in terms of social concern, I can only mention a few. Um, Bishop Antonio Fortich, who has uh, advocated for the rights of sugar workers in Negros. Father um, Edu Garrigues, who advocated for anti-mining uh, for the indigenous communities in Mindoro. Before crowdsourcing became a big thing, Father Jovic Lobrigo, was um, starting grassroots participation in local governance in uh, Albay. And right now, Father Joy Pelino, uh, an Atenean, a Josefino, is um, advocating against mining in Tampacan in South Cotabato. And many other um, Ateneans, Josefinos, influenced by the Jesuits, who are diocesan priests, but are deeply imbued with uh, social concern. Um, and then a question, uh, Father Pierre and Father Robert, if you can comment. How do you assess the churches, I mean the hierarchy now that we have, the bishops and the diocesan priests, involvement in the work of social transformation here in the Philippines? That's a very broad question, but um, perhaps, for instance, not just in in the political economic level, but also in the grassroots level, um, in cultural change, in uh, um, in building a new culture, 
but also in the political level in terms of advocacy, in terms of legislation, etc. How do you assess the level of participation and involvement of our hierarchy? Thank you. Thank you. Other pair, maybe you should answer that because you're leaving the country and I'm staying. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, JV, for that uh, the chairing. Uh, in terms of, uh, again, it's very difficult to assess all of the bishops in the short time that we are here. No, but, but what I can say is that the bishops who do pay uh, attention to the concerns of justice, and I'm sure all of them do, do in various ways, are, can be truly inspiring, no? both those trained by the Jesuits and those who are not. I have been involved for some years now in the National Clergy Discernment Group, no? which is a group of priests and bishops that gather every year precisely to, to discern responses to social and to political issues. The circle, this uh, clergy discernment group, is led by Monsignor Manny Gabriel, who was, of course, another one of our graduates from San Jose Seminary. And every year, uh, bishops help us in our dis discernment. No? The usual, some usual names, no? Bishop Lagdameo, Bishop uh, Tagle, uh, and, and others, Bishop... Uh, 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 and several Bishop Labayan no, and several others. No? So, yes, I think among all bishops, no, there's certainly that sensitivity to the concerns of social justice and the like. No? What I think is a tricky area, and I don't want to speak too extensively here no, because it won't give it a proper treatment, is uh, I think trying to delineate issues of uh, the church's proper role in the political sphere and the whole, trying to clarify the idea of religious freedom, you know, what it means exactly for us here in the Philippines, especially in some, with regard to some very contentious issues like reproductive health and the like. So with regard to the bishops, certainly a lot of inspiration and inspiring initiatives that can be seen. Other questions? Yes, please. Uh, I'm Maria Makasayat from Philosophy Batch 2008. Um, I just, this is in relation to whistleblowing on an everyday basis, so maybe upholding justice on an everyday basis. Um, Father Robert already mentioned earlier the importance of setting an example, and that's how you influence others. My question is, is as, a cult, as, a, as a culture, do you think Filipinos could use a bit more assertiveness, like in terms of being corrective? Is that something that we can maybe encouraged because we're not maybe it's changing now but as a culture we're more individual I, we're more we value relationships more than the individual so i think that's why when we see someone doing something that they shouldn't be doing we tend to step back and not speak about it so my question is do you think that that would help us like encouraging that a little bit more. Do you think that would be some a good idea, and or should we just stick to setting by example and not by words? Thank you, Father Robert. Yeah. Uh, well, for me, I thought, I think the ideal, of course, would be try to to try to speak with your actions and with your words, of course. And of course, we always hear how actions always speak louder uh, than words. No, I'm not an anthropologist, but and I'm sure. The anthropologists can give a more scientific cultural analysis of uh, why, in the words of, uh, I forget the name of the author, you know, why the Philippines is, has at times been called a damaged culture. You know? uh, Father Bulatao before talked about split level Christianity and the like. You know? But I think certainly I agree with you, you know, a certain level of assertiveness, assertiveness, especially when it is channeled towards what is proper and good will be uh, uh, beneficial for Filipinos. I think Filipinos can be assertive but sometimes for the for all the wrong reasons. And we just uh, yesterday for instance I was reading an article, I forget where, where the Pew the Pew Trust, the Pew, Pew survey, there was a recent Pew survey on which countries uh, admire the United States the most. And guess who's number one? No? It's the United States. Uh, it's the it's the Philippines. No? admiring the United States, and it's uh, made all these comments there about how striking this is, despite the fact that they are former colonizers that left the country in grief. Uh, 
blah, blah, blah. No? By the way, if you're interested, the, the country that hates the America the most is Pakistan. No? Uh, so, so there, no? I, I'm sure, as I said, anthropologists can give a more analytical, cultural, scientific explanation for it. No? But offhand, I think all of us can use some kind of assertiveness that is channeled towards the good. I think that even if uh, the truth is sometimes difficult to listen, to hear from uh, friends, uh, it's very important to say the truth. And uh, one element through newspapers and media, for instance, is that they should uh, work more.